everyone and welcome back to the course on medical care organizations this is going to be lesson three or lecture three rather um this is probably one of my most favorite chapters it is going to be a historical overview of the united states healthcare delivery system so having why is it important for us to even know about the history of the United States healthcare delivery system? I'll tell you why. It is actually very important. Um, it, given that we have so many um, issues in our healthcare delivery system, as we're kind of sort of unraveling with this course, um, you're going to wonder how this even started, like what even got the ball rolling to get it to a certain point? Why do we even have the um, beliefs and values that we do have? How did they develop? What influenced um, the way that our healthcare delivery system evolved? Okay, so we're going to kind of get um, dabble into how it formed from the very beginning of the country up until how or where we are now, all right? Um, we're gonna see how kind of, um, how it started, how it formed, and how it, how we got to this point where we're just so um, strongly resistant towards the whole universal health insurance coverage thing. And, um, you know, things like that. How, um, how we're still remain a private industry when we're so huge, how we don't have a central governing agency, how um, the government really doesn't have as much control over the healthcare system that most other large country or developed um, countries do have in their or, um, healthcare system. So we're gonna kind of get an idea of exactly why that is and where it even started. Okay, so how did those ideas even come about? And, you know, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a thing where they just decided, hey, let's form this system right here, and this is just how our country is going to do it. No, it started, um, it started incrementally and just built on itself and became what it is today. So we're going to get into exactly um, what turned it into that and what influences we've had. Okay, so. Right here are the major forces of change that have kind of pushed and pulled on the U.S. healthcare delivery system throughout time and helped it evolve into what it is today. So as we, we're gonna, the next few chapters, or next few slides, we're gonna start from the very beginning um, healthcare, of our healthcare system and we're gonna work our way forward. So as we're moving forward with that, what I want you guys to keep in mind are some of the major forces that um, are dominant around those times and how they may have pushed the healthcare system to evolve, okay, at each point in time. All right, so first we want to look at um, our cultural beliefs and values. So we want to look at exactly where we started from to where we are now. And some of the main themes that you would see uh, in our cultural beliefs and values are the collective beliefs and values that we have going around in this country are um, we have a major thing is self-reliance, entrepreneurship, well, entrepreneurship and capitalism and everything like that, and distrust of the government, that all kind of um, stems from this whole self-reliance thing that we have, okay? Um, then also we do um, have this sense, of, I think it's a nature, a natural sense of empathy for everybody. So since we do, we're emotional creatures, we have empathy um, overall. So because of that, we have this natural or this, um, this desire to help those that are needy, okay? And that those that need it, we want to help them in this country. So those are two of the main cultural beliefs and values that have stood with us over time and kind of influenced where our um, healthcare delivery system has evolved. Okay, so next what we want to look at are the social changes that have been going around, um, you know, during all these different points in time. So keep in mind, we want to look at like demographic shifts. Um, okay, what are the major demographics that are kind of running 
the show during that time, what are the different um, influences that they have had during each point in time. So maybe, um, you know, in the pre-industrial era, you might want to con consider that um, the demographics of the local, of the people in society, who, who were the ones who were able to become physicians, who were nurses, who, uh, you know, things like that. All right. Um, and then when we go into the post-industrial, more modern eras, who, um, you know, which demographics are around, which, how are we evolving, and how might that affect our health and our healthcare system? Okay, also immigration, the status of our population, or the health status of our population. Sometimes uh, when immigration or migration starts to happen, um, because our world is getting smaller, we're kind of sharing our germs, we're sharing diseases, and um, there, so we're going to have more health issues, you know, in certain groups or certain things are going to develop in other people and whatnot. So um, just because we're constantly moving around now. Um, then urbanization, when people move to the cities and how does that affect populations, things like that. Also technological advances. We're starting from the very beginning in this um, when we get into the history, so there isn't going to be too much um, going on in modern medicine and medical technology. However, we're going to see the different ways, the different things that spring up and, um, you know, progress um, our evolution in medicine. But how do these new, invention, new inventions that we do come up with, how it starts to shift and get um, us building on, you know, other things like... <clears throat> coming up with like the x-ray and penicillin and things like that, how that starts to get us moving in different directions, right? Um, also, we're gonna look at economic, or I want you to consider the economic constraints, okay? So the healthcare costs, obviously, of course, when we increase our um, medical technology, then healthcare starts getting more and more expensive. Well, when healthcare gets very expensive, can people afford it? And then what does that cause our society to do? Maybe it makes us um, invent health insurance so that now we can have access to healthcare and things like that. So keep those in mind, start thinking in those terms. Um, political opportunism, What is? how does the president's agenda always affect our healthcare system? I know our last presidency with President Barack Obama, he enacted the ACA, the Affordable Healthcare Act, right? So we have that going. Um, I think almost every president that comes in usually does something to our healthcare system. Okay, um, so keep in mind those, or at least they'll bring something up, or they'll, they'll try to get something moving in a different direction. Okay, um, we get the different parties and how politics kind of moves and whatnot. Also, don't underestimate the power of interest groups, especially there's one major interest group that we're going to come up with or we're going to talk about in this chapter that has dramatically influenced the way healthcare has developed throughout, like since the beginning of the country up until now. And it's going to be very fascinating what this group has done. Okay. Um, and things like that. So, in the healthcare evolution or the history of our healthcare in the United States, we've had four, four main eras. Okay, so first we have the pre industrial era, and that's basically the beginning of America, okay, um, all the way up into the Civil War. All right, so it's pretty much all that stuff. So everything that happened in then. Then you have post-industrial era, which is basically civil war moving forward. Okay. Then we have the corporatization era. So corporatization era started roughly in like 80s, like maybe around 85 or so. That's where we would probably um, put that mark on the corporatization era. So it started around that time. And then the healthcare reform is actually what we are in right now. So this has been like the last like five years or so, like the more recent years that have happened. Um, and that is healthcare reform. So we're going through healthcare reform right now. Um, what, six years ago, we had the ACA that just started and now we're just kind of doing our thing. With it. There's a lot going on in politics right now. So changes are 
still in motion, okay? Um, anyway, let's move on. So first, pre-industrial era. This is a long time ago. This is from before the Civil War, all the American stuff from before Civil War. Okay, beginning of America to the Civil War times, um, 1800s-ish, even before 1800s. I know I put 1800s on this slide, but that's just to give you kind of like a rough idea of when um, actually a lot of the a more systematic medical stuff started happening. Okay, so in the pre-industrial era, the more like physicians and um, where we started creating, you know, nursing as an, mm, not so much an occupation just yet, but um, so this is when we started to actually not necessarily even institutionalize medicine, but there, you know, it kind of actually started to become more of a job as versus before um, before the 1800s where, yes, there was still medicine, there was still medical help, but it was even more primitive than that. And we didn't have um, a lot of the training and everything that we started to somewhat develop in the 1800s going forward. Okay. So anyway, moving on. Medical training during this time was, oh, medical training and education was totally not grounded in science at all. Well, I mean, no, actually it definitely wasn't. Okay. Um, of course, at around this time, they tried to use all of the latest advances in modern medicine. But at the time, most of the advances in modern medicine would either be bleeding, um, a diure diuretics, um, force vomiting, things like that, right? So kind of the idea behind that was um, if there's something wrong with you, if you're sick, that means there's something bad inside you. Something bad is inside your body and we need to do something to get it out. So that was a big sick idea. That was medicine back then. So we got to get the bad thing out so that you're going to be okay. But, and hopefully you won't die of infection or anything like that after we get the bad thing out. So um, for the most part, science was about cutting people so they can bleed out or cutting pieces off um, or just sports vomiting, diuretics, things like that. All right. Um, and any, well, any man at the time could practice medicine. So any man could become a physician, of course not women during the time, but um, you don't need a college education. You didn't have to go to medical school, no four-year degree, no graduate school, no nothing like that. Um, really how it was, um, was just, it, you kind of, you, you get an, um, an apprenticeship with a local physician. Okay, let's say you know this, local physician and ask him to be your mentor your and so you can go or do this apprenticeship and probably for about six months to a year or so he would just kind of train you he'll take you along on on the ride to see whatever patients he has to see and then he'll just show you what he does and then after a while it'll be like all right you know everything i know go off and be a physician good job and now he can start taking patients and doing things like that and starting to try to build his patient base or whatever they did back then. Um, that's how it was then. It was just an apprenticeship. That was um, training. Okay, so no four-year degree, no nothing like that. Um, during this time, being a physician wasn't even like a prestigious career. Okay, it's not like now where it's something that I mean, people even want to show off about, hey, I met this physician. Where, uh, who's who's the lucky, oh, this is doctor, mm, so-and-so. It's not like that. It was not like that back then. Back then, it was almost something you were almost, you were kind of embarrassed about. This was your side hustle. It wasn't even your career, okay? This was you getting some extra money, all right? It was just, a, it was an embarrassing side hustle. Okay, um, and there was intense competition because, of course, people want more money. And this is really a this is a pretty decent, solid gig um, to get more money out of. 
Okay. Um, and what's really interesting is that this is, um, since it was, you know, a good old side hustle and whatnot, a lot of barbers. Okay. You know what? Let me put that down right here. So you guys don't forget. Bar burrs. Okay. Barbers, a lot of them actually became physicians, okay? Mostly barbers back, back then. And the reason why is because it's so easy. Like you have your barber shop, you have, you have scissors and razors, you know, for cutting and things like that. And you, you have probably have access to herbs because you have access to other kind of supplies, you know, for your barber shop different oils and things like that that you normally use for your hair. Maybe you wanna use it as medicine for the body. Also, you have those chairs that do this, okay? So if you have a chair where you could just do this with, then it just makes it so much easier to get that patient to lay down, cut them up when you need to, and do your um, medical services on that patient as opposed to going to a house, their house, and maybe they don't have the right, uh, you know, a decent environment. Maybe a lot of people probably didn't even like physicians coming to their homes either and, you know, doing the work on them in their bed or, you know, wherever because it could be messy and things like that. But doing this at a, your barber shop and having all the barbers have all the equipment and everything is ready. It's like, um, like all the business resources that the barbers already had, they could also use for medicine. So it just made it extremely convenient for them. Okay. Um, so being a barber and then like a part-time physician was a thing. All right. So much. So it was actually very common that, um, okay. You know, those, um, like you normally it's, those uh like outside of barber shops where they have the pole and it's like like it has like it's white and then it has like the the red ribbon going along the pole you know what i'm talking about it's like this let me show you like let's say here's a white pole right pretend this is white all right and then we got red it's something like this. And I know you guys have all seen this like outside of barber shops. Excuse my terrible drawing, but I know you guys know what I mean. Um, so anyway, those type of poles, that actually meant back in the day that, um, so that told all the local people that that barber was also a physician. So you could just go to his barber shop and get like, you know, some medical service and a haircut, they might even have specials, the two, you know, like get one haircut, get one free cutting, bodily cutting, <laughs> and things like that. And this is all because, so, it, you know, it was, it was very recognizable, recognizable when they had this thing, right? Um, and so they still do that today, of course. And of course today, you're not gonna find a barber slash physician, of course, but I think that just kind of like they held on to it, that it's just part of our culture now. But that's where it originated from. It was because uh, what that meant was, it was like, like bandaging and blood or something like that. So that's what that kind of um, meant and it showed all you know potential customers that hey i do both so anyway moving on um so back in the day during this time a lot of um a lot of medicine was actually performed not necessarily by the physicians but a lot of medicine was performed by family members and neighbors and um you know whatnot and they would they would you know do they would um, rely on remedies that they were taught through like their grandparents. Um, also, um, newspapers, like there were sometimes be publications in newspapers or like even like these little booklets and whatnot where they would just have kind of like remedies for different 
um, ailments that could have been going on around that time, like let's say measles was the thing, and it might have some kind of remedy that would help relieve measles symptoms or something like that in there so that people can read it and be like, oh, okay, we just have to get this herb and, um, you know, give it to grandpa or whoever. Um, but that happened a lot. And this was, that, that's kind of how it was um, in a lot of the very rural areas, especially. And typically in those areas, um, families would, you know, congregate. They would like live together. It wasn't like when you get married, you move somewhere else far away. Many times a lot of these people would just sort of live like on the same piece of property and they might have their own homes or like they'll live in the same home or, you know, whatever. So, um, uh, you know, families kind of were close. So it was easier to get like your, your sister-in-law or your sister or grandmother or whoever to help you when you're sick rather than trying to get hold of a physician somewhere. That may not be as easy. However, when you did need a physician, and they would come to see you. Um, sometimes, you know, you would need help with the with the payments for the physician. And what people would do was many times like family and whatnot, they would all or even like your neighbors, they would all kind of put like a little bit of money in a pool and give. So they would sort of raise the money. OK. Like everyone don't put in a little bit of money in the pool and then you use that pile of cash or stuff to pay the physician for their fees. Okay, so this, and back then physicians did were not rich. They did not make a ton of money. They made pennies um, for their services. And sometimes they didn't even, they weren't even able to take money because the, their patients didn't have the money. It would be like they would give you their stuff you know, some of, or a chicken or, you know, things like that. Um, so anyway, back in these days, there were very, very few hospitals and the hospitals that they had were not, um, they were not sanitary. The workers were unskilled. Um, just terrible things would happen at the hospitals. So people actually used to see hospitals during this time as like places of death. OK, you go there if you're when you go there, you plan to not make it out. Basically, those hospitals were terrible and you're not going to get out of there alive for sure. And because it's full of, you know, disease and infection. OK, those are typically just terrible places um, and you definitely do not want to be there. OK, um, and those. Those hospitals were only in the few major cities. I believe it was um, Philadelphia. There's one in New York, Boston, New Orleans. Um, I think the next slide has the actual cities. So I'm all, you're gonna see it in a minute anyways. But um, those were the main hospital places. Like I said, our, techno our modern medicine, our technology, our sanitation was not as advanced as it should have been back then. So we we didn't have the means to really take care of people very well. And people, I mean, saw those places as places of death. Okay. Um, anyway, we also had other um, facilities that people would use back in those days. Okay. So some of the facilities or institutions um, or healthcare institutions that we had back in the days um, were almshouses, there were pest houses, asylums, and dispensaries. Okay, so um, first let's talk about um, almshouses. Almshouses are actually what ha did become hospitals of today. So the old hospitals that they had, they weren't necessarily um, those didn't actually become the hospitals of today, okay? Our hospitals evolved from almshouses. But at the time, these almshouses, um, they didn't necessarily offer any sort of medical treatments or interventions or anything like that. They didn't have any skilled workers. They didn't, um, they didn't do anything like that, really. They didn't have anything to do with medicine. These were actually poor houses. Um, they were there to help serve the destitutes 
of society. The um, the orphans, the elderly, the homeless, the disabled. I know destitute sounds like a terrible word, but um, that's you know kind of what it was. Um, so in these alms houses, it really was just food and shelter, pretty much. Okay. Uh, so it's just for people who really couldn't help take care of themselves, who would otherwise be, um, you know, crawling on the street. Okay, so, and the type of workers that were there helping these people were nurses, really, but they were, were not like nurses of today, because at this time, nursing did not become a very skilled occupation. Back then, they were unskilled. They were, they didn't know anything of being, being sanitary, um, um, really didn't know anything. They were pretty much just girls who were trying to help is really what that was. Um, next we have the asylum. So this is completely government operated, the total public system, and they would care for ch patients who had untreatable um, chronic mental illnesses. The thing is, is that I think you guys have all seen the old like scary asylum movies. You guys have seen these asylum movies with the crazy doctor who does experiments on the, the patients and then, you know, but this all happened like back in the 1800s and then uh, you know, 100, 200 years later, it's like haunted by ghosts and all that, right? You've all seen those scary movies and where that came from. That is actually somewhat real, okay? So in a lot of these old asylums, um, they did do things like that, hor horrible things to the patients, okay? And sometimes the patients were not necessarily... Um, they didn't really have a, an untreatable chronic mental illness, okay? Um, there have been accounts where um, supposedly women were just sent to their, these asylums because their husbands sort of just wanted to get rid of them, so they said, she's crazy, and sent her off to an asylum. Um, also, I don't know if anyone has seen the movie, Ameri or not movie, uh, series, American Horror Story. It, has anyone seen the, the second season, Asylum? And so basically what that season is all about, that, um, it's all about this, this reporter who sort of, who heard about things happening at this asylum. Then she decides to go in, she wanted to ask questions and, you know, come up with, you know, her thing, right? her um, column in the paper or whatever that is. Um, so anyway, what happened was she was poking around a little bit too much. And then they ended up diagnosing her and locking her up in this asylum like she's crazy um, and keeping her there not letting her leave, so she was not able to get out and spread the story. So pretty much the whole, during most of that se like season, it's just her sort of going through and trying to figure out a way to get out of there, but at the same time, she's also noticing so many horrible things that are happening. She's unlocking a lot of the secrets of that whole horrible situation. Um, supposedly, this story in this series was based on an actual story, okay? Um, I can actually give you guys some more information on that in another um, video. But anyway, let's move forward. So supposedly that was a true story. Anyway, so those asylums existed, um, things like that clear apparently happened. And, but going back, some of the, um, some of the modern medical advances and treatments that they would offer to these patients, aside from the experimentation and things like that, that um, we're not really supposed to talk about, but some things that they actually did use and that we know of were the forced bleeding, the diuretics, forced vomiting, and using hot and ice cold baths. The thing that triggers me is that, um, why are they treating the patients 
like this um, when they've already claimed that these patients have untreatable chronic mental illnesses. I don't know what they're trying to accomplish then. What's the goal? Why are they... Anyway, so pest houses. Pest houses were basically quarantines. So court, what they did in a pest house was they would uh, quarantine people who had terrible contagious communicable diseases, okay? Like typhoid, smallpox, cholera, things like that, All right? So it's a quarantine. If you had one of those horrible contagious diseases, they want to lock you up in this quarantine. Basically, there's no treatment for you at this point. They're, they did not treat these patients. They just threw them in. Okay, and let them spend the rest of their days there, and then no disease for other people. So that was the whole point of that. Then we have dispensaries, not like the dispensaries of today. Okay, um, the dispensaries back then were um, <clears throat> these were actually outpatient care centers. Um, well, they were more like free out free urgent cares, if you will. Um, and, and they were set in more urban areas, okay? And so the whole point here was that um, this actually gave some physicians or trainees, some physician trainees or medical students, some a chance to get experience treating patients. So what would happen is those who live in urban areas who might not have the money to pay for like a physician to come to their home and take care of them and things like that they would be able to go to a dispensary tell the new trainee physician what's going on and then they can offer them maybe some herbs or some oh oh okay i get it anyway um free care was given at these dispensaries so anyway Um, oh, another thing I do need to add, now that we are moving forward from all that, um, well, we can go ahead and look at this. So remember back when I said that the hospitals we had were very few, but they were dangerous, terrible, like places of death. Um, okay, so the cities that we did have hospitals in were in New York, Boston, New Orleans, St. Louis, and Philadelphia. So I guess I got all of them except for... St. Louis, won't forget next time. Anyway, um, the thing is, when you compare the United States to how Europe was doing at the exact same time, we were so different. The United States was actually way backwards. We were so far behind. It's not even funny because that in Europe, um, in France and England, and I believe Germany as well, um, they were so much more advanced. They actually had sanitation, okay? They actually cared for their patients. They helped to relieve their um, their diagnoses. They actually helped treat people and were able to, you know, get people to not die. There. So it was pretty great. They had amazing advances in medicine already. They already started actually at this point, incorporating science into their medical practice, unlike what we did. So that was the difference. Okay. Okay. So during this time, before we move into the post-industrial era, I just want to get this thing off my chest. Okay. So it was, this was a little bit, um, this is from 1800s and forward. It definitely wasn't from way before, but at some point, um, these physicians, okay, in America, they decided that they wanted to make more money, okay? And so they all kind of formed this, like, I don't know, Physician Boys Club, right? Called the AMA, or American Medical Association. So it was just a club of doctors, right? Club of physicians. And so this AMA, they started, you know, getting together. They, they started bouncing off ideas and trying to figure out ways in which they can make more money with their profession. And one thing that they did was they decided, let's quit doing this one-on-one -on -one apprenticeship. We're not making much money here, okay? You pay for one student, you spend all this time with that student, and then you send them off, and then that's it. And then 
you kind of just take care of patients until the next student comes along and wants to do this. But why don't we, let's try to develop this profession a little bit more. Let's try to get people excited about becoming physicians, okay? And we can teach them in bulk. Like we can have an actual medical school. We can teach a lot of people to become physicians at once, okay? And that way we get paid a lot more, all right? So what they did was they started to create associations with local colleges and allow the colleges would allow them to um, rent like a room, okay, a classroom, and they were able to fill up with students and they would give maybe about six months or so of like lecture on, you know, medicine or modern medicine at that time. And then you would probably spend maybe six months to a year or however long um, working in a dispensary or doing some sort of apprenticeship work. And that is how you would get your experience. And then from then on, you're a physician. Okay, so they started at this point to kind of develop um, some form of medical school. All right. All right, moving on. So anyway, here we are in the post-industrial period. There's so much happening during this period. It's insane. Okay. Um, just so much started to happen. It just some something clicked in our human evolution at this point, and we just we just took off. Okay, like a rocket, and it's been that crazy ever since. But anyway, so this is after the Civil War. All right, so 1840 and on, or you know, way way forward. All right, so um. Um, before 18, well, before 1900, okay, um, most of, most of the United States population lived in a rural area, okay, only 11% of us lived in a big city, all right, but that'll change 1900 going forward, okay, so at that point, 40% of the United States population just moved over to the city, and that's never happened before, like in our human history, especially in America. That's the first time we ever did something like that. So it was insane. Um, we didn't even know how to prepare for what we were going to experience health-wise alone. I mean, so many other things were happening, okay? But just health-wise. All right, let's just think health. Um, so the suddenly like all these things started to happen at once okay um things that we couldn't have imagined would be a problem all right so we transformed the way we do medicine dramatically during this era this is pretty much what set the foundation for modern medicine as it is today okay right here all right, so just take that all in. All right, so the transformation that we went through was due to urbanization, science and technology, institutionalization of the hospital, but you know, that, that became like an institutional core. We'll get to that later. Um, patient dependency, autonomy and organization of physicians, uh, licensing of medical practitioners and education reform. So many things. Oh man. It transformed the way we do medicine forever because honestly, we have not reformed medicine in this country so dramatically since. I mean, since then, it really has just been about creating large organizations and just adding in new medical technology. So this is what really set the foundation or the tone of like how we evolved our medicine from here on out. So this is pretty insane. 
Um, there's so much to go through here. Um, we're really just going to be tickling the little top of the iceberg or whatever they say, but we're going to do it. Um, so anyway, urbanization. Urbanization probably started most of this, actually. All right, so ur when urbanization happened, everyone moved from the country area, from the rural areas, all the way to the city areas. Almost half of the country did this, okay? Um, and why did people do it? It's because they did it for work, they did it for money. They suddenly realized, hey, it's booming over there in the cities, they, they're making factories, they're making stuff. Um, there's just so much opportunity for work. Why don't we just leave the farm and go straight over there and we'll have a better life? So a lot of people did that. And a lot of people even just sent their family members over to go do that. But anyway, so people moved to the cities for work. That's how it started. Okay. Even during this time, even women were able to enter the workforce. Remember back before this era, women were not even allowed to become physicians, okay? Even though being a physician during this time was seen as a terrible career, like it, like it was like a trash career almost, like, you know, they wouldn't even let women do it. So, but anyway, women started to enter the workforce. So this is, this is where it all starts. Like we really start evolving at this point. It's pretty cool. Um, and since everyone moved over to the city, suddenly we, we increased the physician's productivity. Physicians have never been so busy. Okay. It's so overwhelmed with so much work. And the reason why is because so when we go into these, um, urban areas, especially after never having done this before. So we've never been exposed to so many people at once. Okay, that's why, like you've never seen so many people in one area at once. I mean, we have, or at least most of us have, but back then, no, okay? They didn't know what that was like. And now they're getting close, they're sharing germs, a lot of different germs, like so many different germs. And also they didn't know anything about washing hands, sanitation or anything like that so the sewage was a mess the you know people had like nasty germs rubbing and all over each other they're breathing in all this like um toxic air because of the um the machines and everything like that all the factories started to you know boom and whatnot um so people were getting sick they were also getting injured because most of the jobs that have been created during this time, or at least a lot of the jobs, were kind of dangerous. So we have communicable diseases plus injuries. So it's a, you know, of course we were giving the physicians a lot of work to do. So the physicians got really busy. They were making money, but the work was too overwhelming. So anyway, we needed more physicians at this time. And then, we also had science and technology. And that once we finally decided, let's throw some science into our medicine, suddenly everything started to change. Like we really started to take off. We started to invent all this new medical technology. We suddenly realized that we should be washing our hands. We figured out reasons why certain diseases are happening. We discovered penicillin and, um, the anesthesia for when you do surgeries. <laughs> Remember the pre-industrial period when they were cutting each other? They didn't use anesthesia during that time. Just imagine, right? Um, so now they have it. All right. So during this time, and it's because of science and technology that gave um, you know, people start, suddenly start to believe in science. They started to see what science can do. And that gave this general acceptance amongst all the people. And then we started to actually rely on the medical profession because we realized, or we saw that like, okay, all these physicians doing all this science out here and it, they're, they're putting it all on us when we get injured and when we get sick and so it's working. So suddenly people realize, hey, I don't have to die when I get sick. I can just see a doctor 
and things can um, move progressively. We can, <clears throat> and so we started to rely on medical practitioners and that created like a dependence on physicians. Okay, we've suddenly became more dependent on physicians. Then we've never been actually really dependent on physicians or reliant on modern medicine in the past until this moment right here, okay? Or not this moment, but like the moment that we're talking about in this lecture, okay? So <laughs> this is a list of all the different major groundbreaking medical discoveries that happened at this time. So like I said, anesthesia and aseptic technique, sterilization techniques, antiseptic surgery, x-rays, penicillin, anesthesia, all that kind of stuff, okay? Next, um, during this time also, the hospital started to become the institutional core of the whole healthcare delivery system. Obviously, uh, that's how I felt. Obviously it would, I mean, hmm. Let me explain why. So hospitals, they see a lot of different patients. They probably make a lot more money. They're larger organizations. They're huge facilities, right? They're probably taking in more um, profits. Whereas a little, uh, you know, not a little, but they can be big, but a big or little physician um, probably does not have that much capital Okay, to really invest in all the amazing medical technology that's out there, right? And all the people of this area, of this era, are, you know, that are getting injured and sick, they're relying on modern medicine and the new modern technology. All right, they do not, they're not interested in herbs and getting cut, okay? So physicians at this time had to, in order to be competitive, and relevant and making money in this industry, they had to conform to like the new norm. Okay, they needed to be able to use and they needed to have access to all of this new medical technology. They needed the sterilization techniques, the anesthesia, they needed the hospital beds, they needed the, um, the x-rays and the penicillin and everything like that. All right, so, um, <clears throat> What happened during this time, of course, the, the hospitals would have more leverage. They sort of became the institutional core of this whole healthcare delivery system. Now, the physicians had to create alliances with the hospitals, okay? So that basically, this was like sort of a symbiotic relationship, all right? The hospitals, because they were able to afford all the technology, all the new um, medicine and everything like that, they had all the resources, right? The physicians were kind of the workers. So, and the physicians did not want to work for the hospitals. They sort of refused to work for the hospitals. And we'll get into that uh, in a, a little bit further down, but it's because of the AMA. So the physicians refused to work for the hospitals. They had to create alliances with the hospitals instead. So they sort of became um, business partners instead of working under them. They were not willing to work for them. That's very important to note here. Okay, so what? how this um, relationship worked was the hospital provides resources and physicians provide the patients to the hospital. So the hospital makes money, physicians make money, and you know, everyone's happy. And then the hospitals would usually start to, um, start to treat the physicians with like more medicine more access, more beds, more stuff like that. Whenever a physician seemed to be um, working harder and you know bring more the hospital more patients. So if the hospital knows they were making more money with the you know specific physician, they would give them more access to more stuff. So they would kind of create a you know a win-win situation, you scratch my back, I scratch your back type of a relationship. Um, Next, further down, we have dependency uh, on healthcare delivery and physicians. So during this whole time, and that's kind of where I'm getting, uh, we 
as a society, uh, as consumers, patients, we developed, uh, we finally at this point developed dependency on physicians, on the whole healthcare delivery system. We no longer start, we're relying on like our family members or anyone to help take care of us. When something is wrong with our health, we go straight to a physician, okay? We jump into the modern healthcare delivery system in our United States instead. All right, so we suddenly, as a society, we develop this expectation, okay, that uh, we need medical care to get well, okay? We don't need um, grandmother's herbs. We need science, all right? And just given all that actually gave the medical profession and physicians their cultural authority, okay? Anyway, so then we have autonomy and organization. So during this time, physicians, um, physicians became more independent, right? And many of the physicians, at least most physicians at this time, were part of the AMA. Pretty much almost all physicians were part of the AMA. Remember back in the pre-industrial period when the AMA was just this club of physicians and all that, and it wasn't that big of a deal? Well, in the post-industrial era, this club got huge. It became a huge association. They organized across states. They had different levels, different hierarchies, um, and they they grew in numbers and they grew so much stronger. Okay, so these the AMA, pretty much whatever the AMA believes goes, especially starting from this era. They pushed, they created so many changes in this era and even going forward, but especially in the post-industrial era. So some of the changes, or actually some of the beliefs that they had were that first of all, first and foremost, physicians are entrepreneurs. Okay, that's one of the biggest beliefs that they have. Physicians are entrepreneurs. So they do not encourage, they, they strongly discourage physicians from ever becoming employees, okay? They do not want to see physicians becoming employees of a corporation or employees of, a, of the government, okay? No government salaries, no corporate salaries, okay? Neither. The physician is an entrepreneur. The physician works for himself. So it kind of goes back to the whole institutionalization thing. Like when the hospitals became the institutional core and physicians needed that, um, physicians needed their resources and whatnot, well, the hospital could have said, fine, I'll hire you. The thing is, physicians were not going to be employees. They're entrepreneurs. So they're like, we'll partner with you, but we're not going to work for you. Okay, we'll find another way. Thank you. So the hospitals were like, all right, all right, uh, let's create an alliance. So that's really what it was, okay? In almost every instance, um, even though now it's a little bit different and we do hire physicians, um, in some ways, there are, there are a bunch of different ways in which we pay physicians, actually, and that's also another issue we have in this country. It's just, it's kind of a mess. There's a lot of inconsistency, but um, let's bring it back to here. To this um, point. So anyway, physicians were not going to work for anybody. No corporation, no government, okay? They're entrepreneurs. So that was one of the big, huge beliefs, and that's actually how um, that influenced so much how we've evolved in medicine. That That's a major, that majorly influenced the reason why we, um, we evolved separately from public health. Okay, why medicine evolves separately from public health, that's why we're not together. Okay, that's also kind of, it's done, um, that also leads back to how um, we, we've been so against the idea of um, a national health insurance plan. Okay, because if we have a national health insurance plan, that means the government exercises overall control. That means the government would pretty much, the government would own the hospitals. The government, you know, would, and if the government owns everything and has overall control over the whole system, then the government would hire the physicians and the physicians will not work for the government. So, 
anyway, moving forward. Um, so the AMA was the um, was the brains of so many different major um, changes in our healthcare system during this era. Okay, so um, another one um, that we should remember is that um, so they made it so that it was a requirement for whenever you get like a prescription, you had to have a physician's signature, a physician's authorization in order to even have that prescription, okay? You can't go just go to a pharmacy yourself and just buy things, just buy random drugs. You have to get it prescribed or, you know, an authorization from an actual physician who is licensed. Um, the American Medical Association was um, organized in various different levels, so they had, you know, different state levels, country levels, everything like that. Also, um, the American Association, American Medical Association, um, upgraded our medical education. Okay, it was their doing um, that standardized medical education and standardized how the process in becoming a physician and how you're supposed to get licensed and how you become licensed and everything like that. So they did make it a requirement that you have to become licensed in order to even practice. And this licensure, um, with this licensure, you have to have some experience. So like experience as a resident or intern or, you know, something like that. You have to have at least two years of some sort of like this actual experience before you get to become licensed. Also, you have to have graduated from an accredited medical school. Okay, and they decided that they were going to make medical school a graduate education program. Okay, so moving forward with educational reform, what the AMA did was, first of all, they decided in 1910 that they needed to figure out exactly what kind of inconsistencies and what problems are there really in medicine. Okay, where are they stemming from? They decided that they're going to go straight to education and figure out exactly what these physicians are learning and how they're being trained. And hopefully that'll um, give us some insight as to like, you know, what's going on, why are there inconsistencies in medicine and things like that. So what they found out in this Flexner report of 1910, that's when they made this report, which was actually like a survey. Okay, they um, they found so many inconsistencies in medical education, okay? So people were being taught completely different things in this area compared to this area, and then that area compared to that area, and all that. So it was all different. It was kind of a mess. And so that, you know, if people are being taught different things, that means, like, if you go over here, they're going to be doing different things to you as opposed to when you go over there and get some sort of medical treatment. They're going to be doing something different and the people over there are going to do something different. So people are, you know, you're going to be getting different treatments, different diagnoses, different stuff, you know. So what they decided was that that's not good. We need to have standardizations, okay, and that's exactly what they did okay so this pointed out so many inconsistencies and then they decided you know what scratch this whole medical education thing that we have going on forget the colleges that we have already formed we're going to start something totally new so they decided that they were going to make it a requirement for you to get a bachelor's degree first okay and then you can apply to a medical school graduate program which is four years and during this um degree program, there will they will definitely be incorporating modern science, and it's going to be standardized across the country. Also, they have to incorporate a lab curriculum as well. So laboratory curriculums are very important during this time. Um, and those schools that were not able to make these new changes, remember we had like those old medical schools that um, in their 1800s, that they formed, um, if those schools were not able to keep up with what the new requirements were, then they just got shut down. 
like you're not accredited anymore, you will not be able to produce any doctors. So anyway, moving forward with the post-industrial era, we are not done yet. There are still a few more things that happen in this era. See, I told you they just totally set the foundation for how we do medicine in the United States. So next on the list is that we started to specialize in medicine. So as medicine started to grow, especially when medical technology started to evolve more, uh, we started to have, we had a lot of physicians that started to really zoom in on certain organ systems and really develop medical technology and treatments stemming from that, just focusing on those specific organ systems. And when they did, they realized that they can make so much more money. Okay, there's so much more prestige and there's so much more money. There's so much more growth and everything when you specialize in something. So this is what the physicians found out. They realized this, we can do so much better if we start specializing. And most of the physicians started specializing from that point on, even to now. We have a huge issue because we have way more specialists than generalists in this country, okay? Specialty care is not needed as much as general care. General care is so much more important. That's your primary care. That's your preventative stuff. That's general, that's your maintenance, you know, you're caring for your chronic illnesses and whatnot. And we don't have nearly as many as we need yet we have way more specialists than we need. And the thing is, specialty care is more expensive. So we're also increasing our healthcare expenditures by having so many more specialists than generalists. Okay, so this is starting, this is where we start to see that problem develop. And unfortunately, the more medical technology we do come up with, that sort of feeds back into the system so the, when, the more medical technology, the more treatments, the more medicine, the more things like that that we do develop, um, that that inspires, I guess, in it, or encourages more people to even specialize. And then when we get more specialists, they come up with more medical technology and more stuff and more treatments and more expensive stuff. So it keeps feeding back into the cycle, and we keep develop, we, we keep, you know, raising more and more specialists. Okay. Anyway, um, so this is completely unlike, you know, other developed nations like England, most of Europe and, you know, other places like that, where they don't, they, the way that they evolved was a little bit different. Okay. They didn't evolve in the same way that we did. We have a totally different mentality. We were thinking differently. We started to move in a different direction and that's how we ended up going, hmm, specialty. We're going to, you know, make more money and develop more things. We're in more, more, more. I think that's kind of like what we are actually. We, or what we do, the way we think. We're just like, yeah, more stuff. But um, most of Europe and England and whatnot did not really um, develop that mentality, like that mindset. So they're not always thinking more, more, more like we are. Um, they're thinking about, you know, everyone, the collective in, in some ways, not all the time, but um, I think especially with respect to healthcare, they evolved a sort of mindset like it's everyone deserves a certain level, a certain standard, and if this is what we got, this is what we got. Everyone gets to be at least this level healthy. Um, so they start, they evolved their healthcare system around primary care. And if you evolve a system around primary care, there's no way you're going to have that many specialists. You're going to have way more generalists, and you're going to have specialists when you need them. So that's really how um, those systems work. <coughs> Moving forward. So, one second, sorry. This also happens when... I'm on campus and I have like a lecture in person. Um, I usually get super scratchy and like my throat gets like really dry and tired, especially towards the end. 
of speaking, but unfortunately there, I, I can't do anything about it, but at least now I can. I wish I'm at home and I can have something. So anyway, um, the development of public health. So how did public health develop away from medicine? Why did our health system develop that way? Um, well, they developed separately because... Uh, remember when we talked about um, physicians and that their main objective, especially during this time, was to be entrepreneurs and they're not going to work for anybody, right? Well, they developed separately from public health because if they were had to stick together, to just be together this whole time, that would mean that the government is going to control medicine and health. And the reason for that is because government, like public health could not have become anything different. Or, I mean, if it could have, I just like, you know, it's just, it's definitely not obvious how they would be able to develop in a different way because public health, since the very nature of public health has to do with the public, it has to do with all the populations. I don't think any one enterprise or private enterprise would be willing to, um, you know, do anything for the public unless they're getting paid for it and I don't know how they would be able to work something out where the public is paying some private corporation um, to run healthcare and all that maybe and it looks not like it's impossible obviously you can definitely develop a system I just um, it just kind of seems like especially given like how we are as Americans, I just don't see something like that developing. And um, so public health, you know, since it deals with its nature is focusing on the health of the population, that almost has to be ran by the government, okay? So that has to be a government enterprise. It has to be funded by our taxes. Um, there's almost no other way you can do it. So if that's the case, um, medicine can, if medicine were to have developed along with our public health system, then they would have been together and they both would have been a government enterprise. Now, remember, physicians did not want to work for the government. Okay, they wanted, did not want to work on a salary. They wanted to be entrepreneurs and to be able to make their own money. Okay, and practice in their own way also. Okay, they also wanted the freedom of practice. So, um, so physicians were very strongly against having them develop together. We were so much for having them private. So yeah, they definitely developed privately. Public stayed public, you know, and the, um, there to, uh, you know, as a government enterprise to care for the populations and physicians and whatnot stuck with medicine and they went in their own private direction where they can, you know, care for the patients one on one in their own way and get paid however they want to get paid. Okay. Um, okay, so history of health insurance. Also during the post industrial period. Okay. Um, so workers' compensation. This was pretty much, I don't necessarily want to say it's the first insurance. I don't even want to call it um, health insurance, really. Because back then, um, workers' compensation, although it really it was, I guess, triggered or used, um, during like a like an injury or something like that at work so obviously it had to do with the um, workers health that being said it was not necessarily there to um to pay for bills i mean to pay for medical bills or you know your medicine or your health care or anything like that workers compensation served as just like this means to help compensate you for the loss of income while you're injured and while you're recovering for that or while you're recovering from that illness or that injury okay 
So, um, but what this did was kind of open that idea amongst people and the public and whatnot about um, possibly creating some sort of national health insurance program in the country. Okay, so it didn't start it, it didn't, um, you know, really spark too much, but the idea popped, it like evolved out of this, just having workers' compensation, and people started talking a little bit about it. So anyway, and then health, or health insurance started to develop, but a little bit since then, probably about 10 years after that. 10, 15 years or so after that, or after workers' comp. Um, and there were three main forces that created that need to um, create health insurance in America. So first we have technology, then um, a social force, right? And then we have the economic force. So the technology force is that um, we we created so many, um, you know, amazing new medical technology treatments, um, medical technologies that became available and all of that. But the thing is, and yeah, we definitely started to believe in it. We started to create more independence on medicine and physicians, but many of us were too poor, okay? We couldn't use that medical technology, okay? It was available, but we did not have access to it because it got too expensive for us. And then we have the social force, right? And this is the desirability of being able to use these medical treatments when necessary. We don't want to have to go back to herbs. We want to use this medical technology. We want anesthetics for when we need surgeries and we need penicillin and um, x-rays and like other stuff like that that we're just developing, okay? Um, and then there's that, that economic force of, well, all of this, all these medical needs and um, like catastrophic events, they're so unpredictable. You never know when they're going to happen. What if it happens tomorrow? What if you need medicine tomorrow? You're injured tomorrow. And the thing is you don't have the money to pay for any of it. So what are you going to do? So it's not like you can just, you know, like, well, we'll just put money away. And if it ever happens, then we'll have something to pay for it. You don't know when, you know, something like that is going to happen or you're actually going to need um, medicine. And when you do, will you have the money to pay for it? Okay, so out of those three forces, we started to develop health insurance. Okay, so first modern health insurance plan started in 1929. This is called the Baylor Plan. So you will definitely see this on a test. <laughs> um, the Baylor Plan was, um, it, it was at this university called Baylor University in Texas. And so the story of this is that basically at this university, they it was a medical school, univers medical university, right? Teaching school. So they decided what they want to, a teaching school. <laughs> So it was, it was a teaching, it was a medical university that had a hospital that was a teaching hospital. Anyway, so what happened was um, they decided to try out this new idea where they would um, create like a prepaid plan and then gave it to the teachers. And they said, um, so it was like they paid some, you know, money in the beginning and then for like, I guess, kind of like a membership. Um, and then that way you can have access to all of the inpatient care that you require throughout the whole year. Okay, and they gave that to the teachers and it worked so well for them that they were like, you know what, this is great. We, you know, we made money. We were able to, you know, people were able to use healthcare and, you know, we were able to cycle the money and it worked, turned out really, really well. So what they did after that was they opened that same exact plan, but they gave it to the students. Now the students and teachers have it. it. Turned out so great. And then what they did after that, they decided to give it to everyone else. They offered it to people, just general people. And then 
that became the Blue Cross. Okay. And then in 1939, um, the California Medical Association started the Blue Shield Plan. And this was to cover the physician services, okay, the outpatient stuff, going to physician offices, getting, you know, any kind of secondary primary care um, outside of the hospital was that. Okay. In 1946, in 1946, guys, is when Harry Truman decided to propose that, and I like this idea or an actual plan for a national health insurance system. Okay, that whole Medicare for all that we're talking about. Basically, Harry Truman came up with it. Okay, and he did this in 1946. He was the first president to ever try to make something like this ever happen. Okay, the first guy who actually was so bold to do it. Okay, but he totally got shot down and all the politicians were like, no, very bad. And like, he was just so strongly opposed and it's so sad that that happened. And but during that time and even after that time, there, the mindset of the American people was strongly against having a national health insurance system in the United States. We'll look at kind of the reasons why in a few more slides. But um, next, what I want to say in the timeline is that in 1965, um, we got Medicare and Medicaid. Okay, so Medicare is the one where you need to be 65 and older, okay, or you need to have um, a disability, or you need to have end-stage renal disease. Now, Medicaid is the one that, um, you know, they look at income eligibility for Medicaid. Medicare is the one where um, it's going to be the same in any state, okay? It's completely federal, it's run by the federal government, whatever. Um, you know, your benefits, your benefits in California aren't going to be the same as your benefits in Virginia, okay? Medicaid, however, is going to be different, okay? It's going to be different from state to state. And it's only partially funded by the federal government, and then the rest of it is going to be funded by the state. And we'll look, um, we'll go into detail about what that is a little bit later. So why was having a national health insurance um, program in the United States so strongly opposed over these years? Okay, um, first of all, it did not have a good early footing for the most part. Um, physicians were not going to be willing to work for the government. And that's one of the main things. That's a huge thing, actually. Also, we always have this kind of like anti-tax anti-government um, mentality as Americans. We don't want that kind of thing in our life. Um, we also believe in, you know, entrepreneurship. We believe in capitalism. We want to make money. We want to not necessarily be socialists, especially back in those days, okay? You start, you had to think, 1946, which war was that? All right, and um, so anyway, there, that, during that time specifically, we did have the anti-German sentiment, okay? So we were, I, I, during that time, we were totally anti-German, okay? It sounds bad, but at the time, we were definitely like that. So in, during the time, Germany had like this amazing socialized healthcare system, and they were doing really, really well um, compared to where we were, but we did not want to become them. So we were like, no, you keep your social health, you keep your amazing health care and your health and everything like that. We're going to stay over here and suffer because we don't want to be like you. Anyway, so then um, also another thing is we were totally decentralized. Okay, The government did not have control over our health care system at all. And we were used to it that way. All right. We did not want to change that. So anyway, um, Christian Medicare and Medicaid 1965 is when it happened. Let's move forward. Um, 
get into too much of that. All right, so Medicare. Um, there's no class distinction. Um, there's no, it's going to be uniform national standards. It's going to be the same across the country, okay, because it's a federal program. It actually stems from our Social Security program, which is also federal. Um, well, duh. <laughs> okay, so um, let's move forward. Medicaid, however, is not going to be the same as Medicare. It's going to be different from state to state. Okay, Medicaid is actually formed um, when the state is able to, you know, create or collect all from the taxes, collect the amount of money that they're going to have for their Medicaid plan. They put that all in like some, you know, pool of funding, right? And given however much money they're able to come up with, um, the federal government is going to match it. So, for example, they come up with $50,000, the federal government gives them $50,000, and now they have $100,000 for the Medicaid program. I, I know it's going to be way more than that, but I'm just throwing numbers out just to give you an idea of the concept. Um, so, we got that money comes from federal and state and that is what you get for your Medicaid. So you can kind of see that, um, you know, whatever California is going to come up with in their Medicaid program is going to be different from like Mississippi. Okay, so whatever Mississippi comes up with in their Medicaid program, it's definitely going to be a different amount because it's whatever they can come up with and the federal government will match that. Okay. So everyone's going to have a different amount of money and every state is going to come up with a different eligibility level. They're going to come up with um, different services that their Medicaid program is going to cover and all of that. So that's why the eligibility requirement for, um, for your income level is going to be different from state to state. Okay, so if you're in a country that's going to be, that has a lot of money, they, it, you, you might not have to be as poor, okay? They could probably cover a lot of people. So your income probably doesn't have to be as low as with other states in order to qualify to receive Medicaid from that state, okay? As opposed to maybe a poor state, a state that doesn't have as much money and doesn't have as much money in their Medicaid program, those states, would probably, their means test for determining your eligibility would probably be very low. Like you would probably have to be way, way more poorer than someone of a rich state, you know, in, or, in order to qualify for that Medicaid program. So it's kind of unfair, okay? Well, it's very unfair actually. Um, it, it's, it's a system that helps you know, rich states stay rich and the poor states stay poor, even in health. Okay. Um. Anyway, let's move on. So next we have the corporate era. So this is late um, 1900s to the present. My estimation of the corporate era is roughly 80s. Okay. Because that's when we're going to kind of see uh, like managed care really take off and you know, other corporations and hospitals starting to build chains and things like that, okay? So we're gonna see more corporatization happening from the 80s and on, especially like late 80s and on. Okay, so like I said, this is where managed care starts to really take off. Um, they become actually probably the most common um, healthcare provider and like healthcare, um, like system and it's uh, cause we're gonna we're gonna learn later that managed care is sort of like its own system. It's like its own world inside of the world. Okay. It's its own healthcare system inside of our big United States healthcare system. Like managed care is its own thing. Well well you'll understand why I said that later. But anyway, so managed care grew so well and it kind of became like the norm. It's like the most common, you know, um, vehicle for insurance and healthcare delivery that we have 
now, and it really took off around this time, okay? Then we're gonna start to see more integrated health, health organizations spring up, and um, which you can kind of think of as similar structured and similar to like how managed care organizations are, but they're gonna be different in structure and like how they're managed and um, things like that. But anyway, <laughs> Also, during the corporate era, we have the information revolution. So in this information revolution, we're going to see patients becoming so much more empowered than they ever have been ever. Okay. And this is all thanks to the information revolution, mostly thanks to the internet, actually. The internet's probably what really did it. Okay. That's what really is bringing us information, all of the information in the world we can find on the internet okay we all have access to the internet we all have at least one device okay where we have access to the internet and if we don't there are free devices that we can use at like the library and whatnot to go out and you know get this information so we have resources now we have ways that we ourselves as human beings can become empowered especially in our healthcare thanks to the information revolution. So some of the major um, um, resources or tools that we have developed during this revolution are telemedicine, telehealth, and e-health. We're gonna get more into what these are when we start talking about medical technology, but just to give you a quick um, overview, telemedicine is pretty much um, the, inter the health interaction between the practitioner and the patient. Um, except this is done remotely, okay? So this can be like you being able to get services from your physician through video conferencing, email, phone, anything like that. Okay, telehealth, this is communication from, um, you know, from medical professional to medical professional or even the masses. Okay, this is just delivering health information out there. Um, you know, physicians can get second opinions from their physician friends about certain diseases and whatnot through telehealth. Also, e-health. This is us being able to get information and services over the internet. Okay, so this is being able to use our phones, Google, um, PubMed, uh, any kind of like are you accessing our EHRs through portals on the internet and things like that. Okay. Another um, function or another characteristic of the corporate era is globalization. So basically here we're saying our world gets so much smaller. Okay, so the world used to be huge and we used to be separated and not know anything about each other. And now all of a sudden everyone's so close and we know each other. We're able to connect with everyone across the world. They're coming here. Um, so we have telemedicine, of course, is allowing us to communicate and um, render services and even, you know, from country to country. OK, also, we have medical tourism. Sometimes people over here like to get nose jobs in Syria. I mean, you know, things like that happen sometimes um, in, you know, foreign direct investment in healthcare enterprises. Now, China wants to, China is, I believe, building hospitals in America. And I know we get, we have um, factories and we order supplies from overseas, you know, China and other countries and such. Then we have migration of health professionals. We have, I don't know if you guys have heard of brain drain or brain gain, but we have people from other countries coming into our country and practicing medicine and vice versa. Okay. Then we have overseas operations of United States corporations. Okay, so we have our corporations over there, you know, and other organizations, okay, um, working on in factories and supplies and things like that that have to do with healthcare. Um, we have uh, overseas demand by U.S. providers, okay, and then we have cross-border collaborations. We have, a, we're just, we're really moving around the world and just working together on health, okay? So we're kind of, we're, we're surpassing these borders. We're not, it's not so much us versus them anymore. It's like, let's work together and let's develop things um, for medicine. 
So now we are in the era of healthcare reform. So what we're going to look at right now, um, we're going to look at two different ways in which um, two different um, states that had a few, some characteristics going that our President Obama and his cabinet and his team and whatnot extracted and used in order to create the Affordable Health Care Act that we have right now. Okay, so um, first we're going to look at the Oregon Health Plan, which actually started in the late 1980s. Who knew? Okay, they were, their health care plan was actually a lot more advanced than the nation's so early on. They were, wearing, they, they were ahead of their time. So anyway, let's look at some things that they did that we took, that the rest of the country took. All right, so first of all, we have the expansion of Medicaid. So um, they decided that they wanted to make sure that everyone was able to have some form of health insurance, right, some, some form of health coverage. So what they did was they said, okay, we're just going to, you know, our Medicaid, we have a Medicaid program, let's expand it. Let's make it um, a lot easier for almost everyone to just be eligible for Medicaid. Okay, if they, if you don't have a plan with your with your organization, you can't afford it. We have a Medicaid. You can be part of the Medicaid program. They actually make it really really easy for you to be approved for their Medicaid program and to start receiving medical services. It's so much quicker than it is in California. Just saying. Um. So anyway, and how they were able to do that was they started to imply uh, apply supply side rationing to their program. So they were like, well, we can expand coverage, right, for everybody, but we're going to have to ration some of our supplies. So they would say, all right, well, let's we'll take some of the services that we offer and let's start cutting back. Let's cut back on some of the unnecessary ones, okay? We won't cover everything, but we're going to cover at least some basic stuff for our beneficiaries so that everyone can at least have some sort of basic standard health care. Hmm, sounds familiar, right? So anyway, um, then what they did was that they created this sort of like medical insurance pool that was going to help those who have pre-existing medical conditions. And see, back in the old days, uh, with private insurance carriers, it used to be legal for them to, um, for the underwriters to determine what level of risk you were, okay? And if you are high risk, like let's say you have a bunch of pre-existing medical conditions, okay, that would make you really high risk. Um, insurance companies back then used to charge higher premiums. They used to put limitations on your healthcare coverage and things like that, right? Well, in order to combat that and to make healthcare more affordable for those people who do have pre-existing conditions, they created this insurance pool so that it would, it would kind of help subsidize and reduce the cost of their healthcare premiums so that it just, it wouldn't be unaffordable for them. They can afford it. So that's what they did. And then they, finally, they had the employer mandate, similar to, similar to like what we have today. So basically, if you're an employer and you have 50 or more full-time employees, then you have to pay for their health insurance, okay? Next, we have Massachusetts Health Plan, which started in 2006. So what they did that was similar to, or that what we took, um, was the individual mandate and the employer mandate. Of course, we know the employer mandate because I just talked about it, but they also had an in individual mandate, which was what we have today. So where basically it's pay or play. Okay, you have to have health, some basic form of health coverage all year, and if you don't, then you have to pay a fine. Very simple. Of course, there are exceptions here and there, especially now. We, it's very easy to not have to pay for health care now. Um, you know, but it used to not be. Um, anyway, so in addition to that, they also had some government subsidies to the private health insurance companies for um, to help subsidize health insurance for the low-income people. So for those people who did not qualify for the Medicaid program alone, they 
at least would um, there were government subsidies that were given to like the health insurance, the private health insurance companies that would allow these um, people who had lower income to afford health insurance. Okay, so it, they would be able to reduce like their premiums to like thirty dollars, um, fifteen dollars, things like that. And then what they also had was an insurance clearinghouse or like this connector. So basically, what this is is kind of like exactly what we have now, kind of exactly like what we have now. Um, the, basically, what that is is this is um, so it was like this thing that um, keeps track of whether of who has insurance and who doesn't have insurance, and if you change insurance policies or you change insurance you know, insurance carriers, then they would know about it, okay? They would keep track of it. They know what's happening. So they, you know, by the end of the year when you're filling your taxes and you're, um, they're going to show you, look, this is what we have for you, that you had this many months of um, health insurance and since you didn't have the whole year, so you're going to have to pay us or whatever. You know, so this way... They keep track of everything every time you have insurance, so they know you can't fool them. Kind of like the same thing as what we have now, where they keep track of who has insurance, and really nothing gets past them, okay? So, or at least that's the idea. You're not going to have insurance or even discontinue your insurance without it being reported to the clearinghouse. That's what I'm trying to say. Anyways, that is the end of chapter three or lesson three. Uh, if you guys have any kind of questions, please feel free to comment below. You can comment below also on the website and or just shoot me an email. Okay, see you in the next lesson.